gentlemen. On behalf of my mother and my uncle who are still alive, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about my grandfather. She was in tears all weekend at being so honoured that I would be here today. Let me read to you the opening article from the Jewish Chronicle when my grandfather posthumously was given the Yad Vashem and my mother received it on his behalf. A German soldier snatches an infant from the arms of its Jewish mother and smashes the child's head against a wall. The brief and ghastly tableau and the sounds of the mother's screams still haunt the memories of the then child who saw it all from the window of a nearby house. That child was my mother. My first childhood memory, ladies and gentlemen, is of my mother waking in the middle of the night with nightmares screaming about that episode. That is one of many. After this was published, she received many phone calls. Obviously, it was easy to find a name like Ikhtarovich in the phone book. And this story, sadly, was common. People were calling saying, this happened to my baby brother, my baby sister. <coughs> my mother said this happened to my older brother, my older sister. My grandfather was Dr. Ludwig Lichter uh, Zhurovsky. He was the Krakow city doctor. My grandmother was born in Vienna. He spoke fluent German, so when war broke out, he was kept on by the Nazis. He was given the task of uh, managing the workforce in Fabrika Kavli. This was a massive cable factory in Krakow. The Nazis decided that no longer electrical cables were needed, but mus munitions. An uh, officer from Dresden, a musician, was brought in as commander of that factory. My grandfather told him that he could not take responsibility for the health of the Jewish workforce. He told him that he was not versed enough, did not have the medical knowledge to treat many Jewish diseases, because obviously the Jews have specific diseases. Fortunately, the commander of the factory believed this. My grandfather said, look, if something breaks out, I won't be able to control the outbreak. Production will go down, and you know what will happen to you and me. The commander said, well, what can you do? He said, I have a friend who's a Jewish doctor, Dr. Bieberstein. He is a specialist in these diseases. Could you please get him to help me? Obviously, the commander agreed. Now, Bieberstein, he was in Poishov, a concentration work camp. My father got him out of there, and they worked alongside each other. They had two surgeries. My grandfather took personal responsibility over Dr. Bieberstein. The workforce would come in to Dr. Bieberstein and be treated. In the next room, my grandfather would check the work. He would take out of his bag the medicines, the hair dyes that he had got from Tadeusz Pankiewicz's pharmacy. They were good friends. He would bring the fats out that my grandmother would boil down the vitamins. He would feed up the entire workforce. He would dye the hair of the Jewish workers. Because as soon as you had grey hair, you were taken against the wall and shot. My grandfather had a pass to get through the ghetto. He would do the same, literally dropping off jars of hair dye, of fats, of vitamins, to try and help these people survive. <coughs> Moving on from the factory, there was another case my mum told me about. Pani, uh, Panna Kleperovna, a woman in her late 30s. He diagnosed that she had late stage breast cancer. He wanted her to die with dignity. He arranged false papers like he did for many Jews through a quite wide network of uh, figures in Polish authority uh, that worked together. He gave her a prescription which included morphine, 
But obviously these prescriptions were very long-winded then, with all the ingredients written out how to make up different medications. They planned an escape route, big network of people to help her escape so she could die in freedom. The train she was on was boarded. She escaped, however she left behind her bag. That bag had the prescription in. My grandfather was brought in for interrogation. Now, my mother didn't tell me this. Her elder brother, who's now dead, told me this. When my grandfather came back from that interrogation, he did not have a single tooth left. Everyone had been pulled out. Moving on. My mum described what life was like at home. She remembers children sleeping there a lot. Often she would be head to toe with another girl. If the Nazis came in, my grandmother would start having a go, saying, I've just got five children to bed. What are you doing? You've got to come wake them. How they didn't check which children were in what bed, she doesn't know to this day. My grandmother had four children. There was always some child being smuggled through the house. <coughs> my uncle, who's still alive, uh, he was three years younger than my mother, remembers vaguely being lifted up by his mother regularly in the middle of the night, his bed being moved, the rug being rolled up, and the floor being lifted up. And out of there would come one, two men who'd escaped from the ghetto. My grandfather's cousin, Jan Zhurovsky, and his younger brother, Tadeusz, would arrive in a car from the country estate with potatoes, some vegetables, and also clothes that absolutely reeked of manure. This is something my uncle still remembers to this day. Whenever he smells it, he remembers this. And then they would be changed, and then they would be taken out, smuggled out of Krakow. They're just farm laborers. The more they smelt, the less the Nazis would come up to them, and it was easier to get them out of the city. She remembers that leaflets anti-Nazi propaganda were hidden in the house. She knew where the guns were hidden in their case they ever needed them. She knew that patients would come and see my grandfather. <coughs> these weren't patients, these were part of the network of many Poles who helped create false papers for Jews, who helped them escape, who planned how to get them out safely. She also remembers the sudden inspections that would occur regularly she says one time she counted 17 Nazi officers in their flat opposite the ghetto. And she knew that one time they were very close to finding the guns that they had. She was only a small child. She ran up to the mayor, to, to who she thought was the main officer. Look, look, here's my dolly, here's my dolly. Hold me, hold me. So this guy picked her up, was looking at her dolly, and she managed to distract him. She was giving him hugs and kisses and telling him that she <coughs> loved him because she knew even as a four or five year old child, that if they found the guns, they would all be dead. And finally, let me tell you about Dr. Alexandrovich. Again, a fellow medic, friend of my father, uh, grandfather's. He escaped through the sewers with his wife and son and were hidden initially with a trustworthy family. False papers arranged again by my grandfather. They tried to commit suicide because they just couldn't cope with the pressure anymore. Fortunately, <coughs> Mrs. Alexandrovich ran to my mother and told her what they'd done. My mother remembers my grandmother forcing her to drink milk to be sick. They saved her. They saved Dr. Alexandrovich in hospital. After the war, Dr. Alexandrovich was a very famous doctor. He took my mother on. My mother is a medic as well. And he was invited, Dr. Alexandrovich, for a medical conference to Cambridge in the 60s. He came to my grandfather and said, there's no point in me going. I'm an old man. Let's send Alina, my mother. My mother came to present a medical paper at a conference in Cambridge. She met my father. She stayed here. <coughs> I tell some of this to my children. They will know everything one day. I cannot 
begin to say how immensely honoured I am to be here, how proud I am of my grandfather, but not only of my grandfather. We heard today of someone else who helped, of so many people who did help. It would not have been possible for my grandfather to do what he did without the support of others. Thank you. Thank you.